They'll start out with, the, with before Christ and his genealogy or at his birth, and they'll end at his death or at his ascension. John is not written that way at all. John was written, this gospel account was written in roughly 80 to 90 A.D. John was towards the end of his life when he wrote it. Uh, he was in Ephesus when he wrote it, most likely. And he's telling you a story of what he remembers Jesus to be. A lot of scholars believe that the other three Gospels were already available at the time that John wrote this account. And so when he wrote this account, he wrote 90% of what is written in this Gospel account is unique to this Gospel account. It's not, it's not available in the other three Gospels. And so what you see here in verses 1 through 18 of chapter 1 of the Gospel account of, according to the Apostle John, you see him setting up this story. He's telling you in the first 18 verses what he's going to tell you for the rest of the book. Okay? He, he wants you to sit in awe of who Jesus is. Okay? It's not simply a restating of some facts. He's telling you in verse 1 that the Word was God. That the Word was with God. When all things began, the Word was he wants you to be amazed at who the Word is. And then when we get to the text this morning, he builds this. He's, he's kind of climbing up the mountain here. And when he gets to 14 through 18, he gets to the peak of the mountain and he looks off. And he wants you to be stunned at what he tells you. So if you would, stand with me. We will read God's Word. We will pray. And we'll ask God to teach us. Almighty God, would you teach us this morning? God, move aside our preconceived notions. Move aside our distractions. God, would you teach us who you are? And when we sit here in awe of your character, would we sit here and see that the God, that the, that the Savior who was the Word, who was before time, is for us. Almighty God, may the reflections of my soul and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name, amen. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen the, His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. John chapter 1, 14 through 18, you may be seated. John is telling us in this, in this section all the places he's going to be going in the next few chapters, and he wants you to be captivated by the reality of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. He wants you to see, friends, he wants you to see that the meeting place, the meeting place of God and man is Jesus. The meeting place of God and you is Jesus. It's in and through Jesus. The one in whom God's glory dwells is Jesus. But I want to start us off this morning, I want us to see where this story began. Because you see, this idea of the meeting place of God began a few thousand years before this was written. The Hebrews in Exodus 14 left captivity of the Egyptian rule. They crossed the Red Sea in chapter 14. In chapter 19, Moses and the Hebrews go to Mount Sinai. Moses scales the mountain, leaving the people at the bottom. God gives him laws, he gives him rules and regulations, he gives him the Ten Commandments. He tells him in what manner and with what substance he should build the tabernacle. Many other laws about the manner in which he is to build these things. Well, Moses is gone a little longer than expected. And the Hebrew people, God's people, grow impatient. And so they go to Moses' brother Aaron and they say to Aaron, Hey Aaron, get up! Wake up. We want to worship a God like our neighbors. We want someone to be thankful to and to show gratitude uh, towards. Well, Aaron, because apparently Aaron didn't have a backbone, 
he agrees. And he melts down their jewelry in the furnace and out pops a golden calf. And the calf prances around in the camp and the people worship. God knows what's going on and tells Moses, Moses, go down and deal with your people who you brought up out of the land of Egypt, lest I consume them in my anger. So Moses goes down and deals with the people and then goes back up to atone for the sins of the people. God says to Moses, I will blot out anyone who has sinned against me. And this is a key piece here. He's, God says, you may go and possess the land that I promised to your fathers, but I will not go with you. You can have my gifts, but you can't have me. I will wipe away your enemies, but I, my presence won't be with you. Now, friends, this is tempting, isn't it? The people of God were offered the promises of God without the presence of God. They were offered his gifts, but they weren't offered him. Friends, let's not be so arrogant to think that this is strictly an Old Testament Hebrew problem. We too can be tempted to accept the promises of God without the presence of God. Would we be willing to accept success in life apart from God's presence in our life? Material success, visual success, without God's presence in our life. I would say we certainly have and can and will. Not only us as individuals, but there are some churches that certainly will build large buildings and say, look at us, and there is no presence of the Lord among them. Now you see Moses and God were close. They were very close. It says in Scripture that Moses talked to God as one friend talked to another. In the old days, Moses would go into the tent of meeting and meet with God face to face. While he was meeting with God, the people would come out of their homes. And they would stand on their doorsteps and they would look where Moses and the Lord were. And they would worship. They were in awe. But you see, things have changed. The Hebrews have violated the covenant the Lord decides to fulfill his part of the covenant, the land, but that would be the end of the relationship. You can have what I promised you, but that's where it stops. So Moses says back to the Lord, and he goes back to the Lord and he says, Lord, if your presence does not go with us, we won't go either. And the Lord says back to Moses, this very thing, very thing that you have spoken to me, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And Moses replies to him, and I want you to hear what Moses said. It's one sentence, but it's so important. Please show me your glory. See, Moses had already seen the glory of God. Why did he want to see it again? He had seen it before. He wanted to see it again because when you see God's glory... You develop an insatiable desire to see it again and again. Nothing comes close to being as good as God's glory. Nothing comes close. There's not one thing life can offer that touches the glory of God. When Moses was deep in a cave for his own protection, God set him back in a cave as, and uh, he set him there to protect Moses from his glory as he was to pass before him. The Lord passed before him, and this is Exodus 34. It says this, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. God is saying this to Moses as he's passing. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. If you have your Bible open to Exodus 34, you underline that part because we're going to see it again in John. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth, and he worshiped. And Moses said in reply, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. Give us your presence, Lord. Go in the midst of us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. We fast forward to Exodus 40 briefly. The tabernacle is built, and this is what it says. Then the Lord, then the cloud covered the tent of the meeting, and the glory of the Lord 
filled the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The place of God's presence, of God's residence, was the tabernacle. And Moses, it said, was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. The cloud represented the Lord's presence. And if the Lord's presence was not going, they were not going either. So why am I telling you this? The glory of God, the presence of God, dwelt tabernacle in the midst of the people. And perhaps you're wondering, what does this have to do with John? If you're coming on Sunday nights, I hope that you're seeing that there's a common story that's being told. In all of Scripture, this is no different. In the first 18 verses of John, the apostle is building momentum. We see, in the the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we get to verse 14, and this is when the momentum hits a climax. He's not communicating just mere facts about a person. He's not communicating, or he is communicating the glorious realities of his subject. He wants you to be in awe like the Hebrews were when they saw the glory of God. And here's what we see beginning in verse 14. The Word, who is God, became flesh, and he dwelt among us, the Greek word there is skenao, which means literally to live in a tabernacle. It means to tabernacle, the word to dwell. When it said the word became flesh and dwelled among us, it said he tabernacled in the midst of us. Back to the Old Testament, where was the glory of God dwelling? The tabernacle. Where is the glory of God dwelling? Here. He tabernacled, he dwelled in the midst of us. And the word became flesh and dwelled among us, can we, and we have seen his glory. We have seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. It says, we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. What is his glory? It's full of grace and truth. We saw in Exodus 34, 6, it said, The Lord, the Lord, God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The the, the ideas of steadfast love and faithfulness is the exact same idea in Scripture of grace and truth. Abounding in grace and truth. It's an echo of Exodus 34, 6. Listen, the word who is Jesus... Jesus is God, the eternal one. Jesus, the incarnate son. Jesus, who became flesh, dwelled among us. God came to earth, took on flesh, and lived beside you. Can you believe this? I mean, if that does not bring you to just absolute amazement that Almighty God... Dwelled as in a, dwells in a dareville. You should be, I mean, really check your heart. Because friends, God dwells among his people. See the glory of God. Here's what this text means for us. The humanity of Jesus is both true and necessary. This is your outline in your bulletin. The humanity of Jesus is both true and necessary. Jesus had a human body. Luke 2.52, and it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. John 4.6, it shows that Jesus on his travel became weary. Jesus had a human mind. There in 2.52 again, you, said it, you see that it said Jesus increased in wisdom. Mark 13.32 says that Jesus does not know the day of his return, So in some ways, Jesus is like us. He has has a human nature. John's response to, at the time, there was a a heresy, I've mentioned it before, called a Gnostic heresy, more specifically, a Docetic heresy in those days that said that Jesus was not flesh. 
So you see, I mean, Jesus hadn't been dead for 60 years, and there was already heresy. All right? John, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, he says this. In response to heresy, he says this. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out in the world again. Few decades after Jesus is gone, he's already saying, Listen, there's many false prophets that have come and are going out into the world. But by this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses, confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So, in other words, if they deny the humanity of Christ, do not listen. Do not listen. Turn them off. Three implications of Jesus' humanity. Jesus' humanity is true, and it is absolutely necessary. The first implication, Jesus obeyed for us where Adam failed. Christ's obedience is our obedience. Romans 5, 19 and 20, Therefore, as the one trespasses led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Christ was the Adam. He was the good and perfect Adam. Because of Jesus' perfect obedience, those who have believed and received him in his name are credited with perfect obedience. We've gone through this many times. Your sin is taken from you and placed on the cross. Christ's righteousness is taken and put in your account. Nothing you did to earn that. Nothing you did to earn that. Through his humanity, Jesus is our substitute sacrifice. Had Jesus not been man, he could not have died. If he did not die, he could not pay the penalty that is due for us. Why? Romans 6.23, the wages of your sin is your death. The wages of sin is death. If Christ is not man, he cannot die. If he cannot die, he cannot pay your penalty. Hebrews 2, 16 and 17. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham, therefore, spiritual offspring of Abraham, therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. Substitute sacrifice, new and better Adam, because he was human. Third, through his humanity, Jesus can sympathize as our high priest. For because he himself suffered when he is tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Why? Matthew 4, Jesus was tempted numerous times in every way that we can be tempted. Jesus is able to understand our pain. He's able to understand our fear. He's able to understand your anxiety, your struggles, when we hurt, when we desire for joy, he understands. He gets it. He's been there. He's asked the Father, 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 take this cup from me. I don't want to enter into the pain that I'm about to enter into, but yet not your will be done. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Number two in your outline there, the, 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 number one is the humanity of Jesus is both true and necessary. Number two, the divinity of Jesus is both true and necessary. God, Jesus was fully man and fully God at the exact same time. When he became flesh and when he dwelled among us, he gave up nothing of his godness. Nothing. He took on flesh. I won't rehash the uh, biblical evidence of Christ's deity since I spent 30 minutes of it on it on July 10th. If you want to see that, go to adorablebaptist.com and watch the sermon. But here are three implications of Jesus' full divinity. Through his divinity, Jesus bore all sin for all who believe. A mere man could not have borne the, all of the sin, could not have, have taken on all sin. Jonah chapter 2 verse 9. We're going to study Jonah next Sunday night. But Jonah 2, 9, salvation is from the Lord. The entire message of Scripture, friends, all of the Bible, all of Scripture is designed 
to point you, to show you that salvation can only come from God. It can only come from God. No finite being can bear the penalty of sin, only an infinite God. Through the divinity of Jesus, Jesus is the mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. His mediatorial work brings us back to God reconciles us with God. We say, does God hate sin? No. Yes. God hates sin. Hates it. And he punishes it. Your sin, for those who have received him and believed in his name, your sin was punished on that. On the cross. Don't miss that the cross was both wonderful and terrible at the exact same time. Jesus took all of your sin. Through his divinity, Jesus reveals God fully to us. John 14, 9, Philip said to him, Lord, I love this. Lord, show us the Father. And it's just, that's enough for us. <laughs> and Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me? <laughs> I love that. Show us the Father. Jesus says, I've been with you all this time and you still do not know me. If you ever feel like you're just not getting the Bible or just not getting scripture, just remember there were people that were within an arm's reach of them that did not see his glory. <laughs> they didn't see it. He goes on, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Through his divinity, through his humanity, Jesus gives us God. I want you to hear this. This might be strange to some of you, but I want you to hear this. Ultimately, all of this, and the reason that I started in Exodus, the point of those passages was so the people of God would be in the presence of God. Ultimately, all of this, all of this, the taking on of flesh, the dying of death, all of this was so that you could experience God. To live in God's presence, to function and move about each day with God's presence. In Jesus, we have the presence of God. We come to Jesus. Listen. We come to Jesus to get God. We come to Jesus to get God. We don't come to Jesus to get God's stuff. That's what Israel was doing. They said, as long as we have the stuff, we could care less whether or not we have the presence. And God was saying, I'll give you the stuff and I will never go with you. Friends, do not make that mistake. We come to Christ for God, so we can know God, so we can be in a relationship with God, so we can live in His presence. We don't, and I'm going to say this, we don't come to, God, to Jesus for salvation. We get salvation when we come to God. Salvation is a byproduct of trust in Jesus. When we trust, we're saved. Friends, you go to Jesus, you go to the Father so that you can have Him. Don't go ask for His stuff. Don't go ask for His stuff and then leave Him. It's blasphemy. You go to God to get God. If you want God, you come to Jesus. If you want God's presence each day, you go to Jesus. If you want, if you want victory every day of your life, Every second you go to Jesus, who is God. 2 John 9, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. But whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Church, do you want to see his glory 
Do you want his glory? Do you want to see it in your life? Do you want to see it in this church? Do you want his glory? Do you want to be a part of that? Do you want his presence? Do you want to see God do things among this body that cause you to step out and be amazed at what he's done? Come to Jesus. Come get Christ, the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity. Brothers and sisters, I want you to be amazed at this God. I want you to sit and just be blown away. We talk about theology as a mountain range, and we look upon theological truths. And brothers and sisters, there is not another theological truth that has a peak higher than this one. There is nothing more glorious than the fact that God himself, like in the Old Testament, he heard the cries of his people. God heard the cries of his people. He put on flesh. He lived a perfect life, and he died a death that, brothers and sisters, you cannot die. He lived a life that you cannot live, and he paid the penalty that you cannot pay. Drink deeply the truths of this God. I mean, breathe it in. Soak it in. Friends, when you sing, when we sing a song, you're singing to this God. I mean, that's huge. And he hears you. He hears every voice in this room. Every voice. He can parse them. He can say, that's this person, and that's this person. And when you don't sing, he knows it. We sing to this God. When you read, when you read the word of God, you're reading the word of this God. This God. You're reading one. I was talking to a gentleman a week or two ago about various religions. And usually when I do that, I draw a mountain. Okay? And I don't draw a good mountain, but it's basically a pyramid. And you have the gods of Islam, Hinduism, Judaism, whatever else you want to put down here, and then Christianity. And we said, basically, all religions are trying to climb up to the mountain to get God. And what I said was, yeah, that's right. But what happens in Christianity is, is God, he came down the mountain to us. And that's different. When you read, you're reading the word of this God. Settle for nothing less. Nothing less. Nothing less. God became flesh and he dwelt among us. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come to you this morning in prayer, in song, in study. Father, show us your glory. God, we want you. We want your presence. We want you to reveal yourself in our lives. God, would you teach us? Would you show us? Would you guide us? If there's anyone here this morning, some of you, it's decision day again, and, and maybe you missed it in prior times. Some of you need to be baptized. You need to show your church and your community that you are a raised, you are a sinner who's been raised from the dead. You believe in Jesus. Some of you need to be saved. You need to come to Jesus. You need to come to Jesus and be reconciled with God. And some of you need to join the church. At our invitation time, I want to invite you to do that. Almighty God, thank you for this church. Thank you for your word. Would you bless this time in Christ's name, amen.